Testing one. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are going to be doing Come Follow Me, Second Nephi 20 through 25. This is week number 10 of Come Follow Me. Today we're going to be going through Isaiah, this chapter, a little bit more of them. And so, yeah, let's just jump right on to it. So, we're just going to start off with the Come Follow Me manual. It says, The writings of Isaiah include strong warnings, but they also offer hope and joy. This is one reason Nephi included them in his record. I write some of the words of Isaiah, he said, that whoso shall see these words may lift up their hearts and rejoice. And a sense the invitation to read Isaiah's writings is an invitation to rejoice. You can take delight, as Nephi did, in Isaiah's prophecies about the gathering of Israel, the coming of the Messiah, and peace promised to the righteous. You can rejoice to live in the prophesied day when the Lord has set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel. We'll read that in 2 Nephi chapter 21, verse 12. When you thirst after righteousness, you can, uh, with joy, draw water out of the wells of salvation. In other words, you can rejoice in Christ. So let's just move on down to the ideas for learning at home category. It says, I can find peace in Jesus Christ. Lehi's children had a problem with contention. The problem got worse in future generations, leading to division, captivity, sorrow, and destruction, and contention continues to be a problem today. With all that in mind, think about the prophecies in 2 Nephi 21-22. Consider how the Savior is fulfilling these prophecies. What does the prophecy that the wolf will dwell with the lamb mean to you? Ponder what you can do to be a peacemaker. Next section is the Lord is gathering his people. It says Nephi and his people were witnesses to the scattering of Israel. Now you can participate in the gathering of Israel as you read 2 Nephi chapter 21 verses 9 through 12. Think about how you can help fulfill the prophecies these verses describe. For example, as you read about the ensign, the standard or banner that will be raised to gather God's people, think about how you have seen God gather his people physically and spiritually. What attracts people to the Lord and his church? What do you feel inspired to do to help gather God's people? Next is the worldliness of Babylon will fail or fall. Both of those actually. The kingdom of Babylon was a mighty political and military threat to ancient Israel. But to Nephi's people, and to us today, the bigger threat is what Babylon represents, worldliness and sin. Consider how the warnings in 2 Nephi 23-24 might have affected people who feared or admired or trusted Babylon's wealth and power. What are some similar things that, that we might fear or admire or trust today? What do you feel the Savior's message to you might be in these chapters? Think about how you can show that you rejoice in the Lord's Highness. Next chapter or next section is We Talk of Christ. Dot, 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 we rejoice in Christ. Nephi was open about sharing his beliefs, especially his testimony of Jesus Christ. Throughout your study of 2 Nephi chapter 25, think about Nephi's desire to persuade his children to believe Christ and to be reconciled to God. What did Nephi want people to know about the Savior? How did Nephi try to persuade him to believe in him? Note passages in the chapter that persuade you to believe in and follow Jesus Christ. Some of us may not feel as bold as Nephi was while talking of Christ, but maybe you can find something in Nephi's teachings in 2 Nephi 25 through 20 or chapter 25 verses 23 through 26 that inspire you to talk about him with others more openly. For example, Nephi's declaration, we rejoice in Christ, might prompt you to think about how the Savior brings you joy, and how you can share that joy with others. In his message, we talk of Christ, in the Ensign of Liahona, November 2020, or pages 88 through 91, Elder Neil L. Anderson suggests how we can uh, speak more openly of Christ in various settings. Which of his suggestions stand out to you? What opportunities do you have to talk to, of Christ with others? What do you feel inspired to tell others about Jesus Christ? If you need some ideas, you might search the Living Christ Testimony of the Apostles in the Gospel Library. A hymn like I Believe in Christ should give you more ideas. Oh, that's next week's. Let's go on to the chapters. But before we do that, let's just get started with a word of prayer, just because as we read the scriptures, we can... Um, Notice by saying a prayer that can help us understand things, especially this Isaiah. So let's just go ahead and offer a word of prayer really quick. Our dear, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we are thankful for today, and we're thankful for all of our many blessings, and we're thankful for the scriptures, and we're thankful for the opportunity that we have to read 
Nephi and his teachings of Isaiah to his people. And we just ask that we can understand what is being taught and said, and that we can learn and take away different things that we can apply to our lives. Father, we're thankful for the many blessings that we have, and we're thankful for the church. We're thankful for, again, Jesus Christ, and we ask that we can have a good rest of our day today, and we see these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. I will turn also off the loop of the song as well, so that we can move on to some more music as well, once the song finishes. So I'm going to fix the lighting, because it's kind of annoying me. There's a reason why I should not look at the stream as I go. Also, I make sure that there's like not technical difficulties or anything, but then the lighting always throws me off. Also, I'm extremely sore because we got like a butt ton of snow yesterday. And I've been shoving and shoveling out uh, other elderly people in my area, so I my my arms are extremely dead. So it's fine. We'll just go through it. I don't need or all I need for the stream is my vocal cords and one finger to scroll. So we're fine. And water. So, the destruction of Assyria is a type of the destruction of the wicked at the second coming. A few people will be left after the Lord comes again. The remnant of Jacob will return that day. Compare Isaiah 10. So, I'm also going to be referencing throughout the stream for the guys that are new. I referenced this book, The Book of Mormon Made It Easier for Teens by David J. Ridges, where he just is basically a pretty smart scholar who worked at BYU, and he's just really smart when it comes to this stuff. And, you know, I'm also learning as I go, as I read throughout the Book of Mormon. And I think that we can kind of just learn from what he has to say. So he makes this comparison here towards the introduction about this first little statement here. The destruction of Assyria, the type of destruction of the wicked at the second coming. He, he re relates different Old Testament characters, such as Joseph in Egypt and Isaac to Christ. So let's look, take a look at Joseph in Egypt's life. He was sold for the price of a common slave. Christ, he was sold for a price of a common slave as well. Joseph in Egypt was about 30 years old when he began his mission as a prime minister to save his people. Christ was 30 years old when he began his formal mission to save his people. Uh, Joseph in Egypt gathered food for seven years to save his people. Christ used seven days to create the earth in which to offer salvation to us. Joseph in Egypt for, or forgave his persecutors. Christ also forgave his persecutors. For Isaac's case, he was the only begotten of Abraham and Sarah. Christ is the only begotten of the Father. Isaac was to be sacrificed by his father. Christ was allowed to be sacrificed by his father, too. For Isaac, he carried the wood for his sacrifice. Christ also carried his cross for his own sacrifice. For Isaac, he volunteered to give his life, and Christ also gave his life voluntarily. So, so similarly, as stated in the heading, few people will be left after the Lord comes again because the wicked will be destroyed at the second coming, and that way the death of the Assyrian soldiers is a type of destruction for the wicked at the second coming. And just as it kind of talked about during the book of, or the Come Follow Me manual, you no, know, whatever talks about Babylon here, it really is just saying worldliness and sin. Let's just kind of take a look at Assyria really quick. So, as it mentions in the heading, the Book of Mormon says the destruction of Assyria is a type of destruction of the wicked at the second coming. The Syrian armies did come and attack Syria and Israel, as prophesied in chapter 18, verse 4, and elsewhere. And the armies also came into Judah and got as far as the city gates of Jerusalem. As mentioned in verse 32 of this chapter, chapter 20, but there the Lord stopped the Assyrian army cold, as stated symbolically in verses 33 and 34. 185,000 Assyrian soldiers died overnight, as mentioned in 2 Kings 19.35, and the few that were left went back home. So... Similarly, as stated in the heading, or we already read that. Okay, awesome. So this chapter starts out describing dishonest and corrupt political leaders who do much to ruin their country. So that's what we will kind of look at. And we also may be able to look at some of our current world leaders today, not just in the United States, but also worldwide. 
because there's corruptness happening in a lot of different places and we have to be careful where we're getting information from and a lot of political leaders are unfortunately are unfortunately not that trustworthy despite what you may think with your own different political beliefs whatever but the truth is the scriptures that we're going to be reading here is going to kind of point a nudge towards that so let's kind of read it it says one woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees and that right grievous or grievousness which they have prescribed to turn away the needy from judgment and to take away the right from the poor of my people that widows may be their prey and that they may rob the fatherless next the lord through isaiah asks what these corrupt political leaders will do when they themselves are badly treated by the Assyrian armies and what will they do in the day of visitation and in the desolation which shall come from far to whom will ye flee for help and where will ye leave for your glory um without me they shall help no oh, sorry just sit my microphone will bow down under the prisoners and they shall fall under the slain for all this is his anger is not turned away but his hand is stretched out still now isaiah gives a message from the lord to the assyrian king sargon Sargon thinks that he is terrific in and of himself, isn't he? O oh, Assyrian, the rod of mine anger and the staff uh, in their hand is their indignation. I will send him against a hypocritical nation and against the people of my wrath, while I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mirror of the streets. Um, Howbeit he meaneth not so. Neither doth his heart think so, but in his heart it is to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. For he saith, Are not my princes altogether kings? Is it is not Kalno as Karchmish? We'll go with it. Is not Hamath and Arpad or as Arpad? Is not Samaria as Damascus? Next, the Syrian king boasts that he and his armies are more powerful than the idols or gods worshipped by the countries and cities where he has conquered. He claims that those idols are obviously more powerful than the god of Jerusalem. He is wrong. 10. As my hand hath founded the kingdoms of the idols, and whose given images did exceed or excel them of Jerusalem and of Samaria, Shall I not, as I have done unto Samaria and her idols, so do to Jerusalem and her idols? Um, wherefore it shall come pass, that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion upon Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria, and the glory of his high looks. For he saith, By the strength of my hand, and by my wisdom, I have done these things. For I am prudent, and I have moved the borders of the people, and have robbed their treasures, and I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. And my hand hath found as a nest the riches of the people. And as one gathereth eggs that are left, or have I gathered all the earth? And there was none that moved the wing, or opened the mouth, or peeped. Next, Isaiah uses some very fascinating imagery in describing how ridiculous it is for King Assyria to take credit for himself for his amazing accomplishments. There are an important, or there's an important message in this for all of us who might at times take or accept credit for accomplishments in the work of the Lord. As you read verse 15, you might find it uh, a bit humorous. 15. Shall the axe boast itself against him that heweth therewith? Shall the saw magnify itself against him that shaketh it, as the rod shall shake itself against them, lift it up, or as if the staff should lift up itself as if it were no wood? Therefore shall the Lord, the Lord of hosts, send among his fat ones leanness, and under his glory he shall kindle a burning like the fire, or like the burning of a fire, and the light of Israel shall be for a fire, and his holy one for a flame. And shall burn, and shall devour his thorns and his briars in one day. I'm gonna turn up the song a little bit. Oh gosh, not that. Hi, it's fine. We'll go with that. And shall consume the glory of his forest and of his fruitful field, both soul and body, and they shall be when as a stand bearer fainteth. Um, give me a second, guys. 
just turn the page of my book here. So the prophecy of the destruction of, upon Syria, given in verse 17 above, happened suddenly as mentioned previously. 185,000 Assyrians died of devastating sickness in one night as they prepared to attack Jerusalem. Prophecy is continued with additional repetitions in 18 and 19. Now we're on 19, which says, And the rest of the trees of his forest shall be few, that a child may write them. 20, and it shall come to pass in, the, in that day that the remnant of Israel and as such are or as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord uh, or the Holy One of Israel in truth. Okay. So, let's see here. Next, Isaiah again emphasizes the future return of Israel to their God. This now, ha or this is happening now in our day with the gathering of Israel that is taking place under the direction of our current prophets. Currently, President Russell Nelson, as the time of where we are recording this. Verse 21 The remnant shall return, yea, even the remnant of Jacob unto the mighty God, for thou. Or for though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. The consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness, for the Lord of God or the Lord God of hosts shall make a consumption, even determined in all the land. Next Isaiah emphasizes and repeats again the prophecy that the Lord will stop the Syrians in their tracks. He adds that they will be stopped at the very last moment, just as they position themselves to enter Jerusalem. So again, just remember, Isaiah does repeat himself quite frequently. So if you're like me and you're confused at what the crap Isaiah is saying, just listen to these different captions. That may help you piece things together. So, uh, yeah. Just give me a second, y'all. I need to... Do something. Okay, awesome. Let's move on. So, 24. Let's read. 24 here. Therefore, thus saith... The Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod, and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. For yet a very little while, and the ignition shall cease, and mine anger in their destruction. And the Lord of hosts shall stir up the scourge for him, according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. And as his rod was upon the sea, so shall he lift it up after the manner of Egypt. Um, and it shall come to pass that in the day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. As previously stated, Isaiah is a master of drama. Next, he will uh, create a high degree of tension as he prophesies the advance of the Syrian armies upon Jerusalem. It will look like Assyria will not be stopped. Assyrians will easily take several cities leading right up to the outskirts of Jerusalem and it will look like Jerusalem is doomed despite Isaiah's prophecies to the contrary and 26 so yeah he is come to Athia he has passed to Migron at Michmash or Michmash which hi there <laughs> I sorry about that he he has come to uh, Aeth, he is passed to Migron and Mikmash. He hath laid up his carriages. Okay, so yeah, so basically these different names are just different kings of a or or no, sorry, they're the names of the cities that the Syrian king conquers as he heads towards Jerusalem. So that's kind of what this is. Um, so let's continue just to read. There are over the passage, they have taken up their lodging at Geba, or Ramath is afraid, Jibia of Saul is fled, lift up the voice, O daughter of Galim, cause it to be heard unto Laish, O poor Anathoth, or Madmina is removed, the inhabitants of Jibim gather themselves to flee, as yet shall he remain at Nob that day. He shall shake his hand against the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. Um, behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, shall lope the bow with terror and the high ones of stature. 
shall be hewn down, and the haughty shall be humbled, and he will cut down the thickets of the forest with iron, and Lebanon shall be fall or shall fall by one way. I think that's what it said. I I quoted the best, but it's fine. Um, so for chapter twenty one, the stem of Jesse, aka Christ, will judge in righteousness. The knowledge of God will cover the earth in the millennium. The Lord will rise uh, in an ensign and gather Israel. Compare Isaiah eleven. So this chapter is similar to Isaiah chapter eleven in the Bible. Then. Joseph Smith History in the Pearl of Great Price, chapter 1, verse 40, Joseph Smith said that the angel Moroni quoted the chapter to him when he appeared to him on September 23rd, 1823, and said it was about to be fulfilled. So let me turn that down. This one's a bit of a louder song. Um, in this chapter, we are taught that powerful leaders will come forth in the last days to lead the gathering of Israel. We are instructed in Christ-like qualities of leadership. We will be shown the peace that there will, or that will be here during the millennium. And I, sorry, and Isaiah will also teach us some things about the last days gathering Israel. As you know, our prophets are strongly emphasizing the gathering of Israel today. 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Christ, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Perhaps the imagery here in verse 1 grows out of the last two verses of chapter 20, where the wicked leaders have or end up as stumps and have been destroyed. In the last days, new righteous powerful leaders will be brought forth to replace the stumps of the past and will have their origins from the roots of Christ. Roots can symbolically represent being solid or and firmly rooted in Christ. Christ-like qualities of leadership are described next. These are the leadership qualities that you will need to have to, or, and learn to have as you are called to various assignments in the church throughout your life. These verses also show us the qualities of righteous and leader, or righteous leadership Christ himself will have. So yeah, let's go ahead and read some of that. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding. So, leaders, they need wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and might. The Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. Um, so, let's just, uh, so, let's just talk about the next chapters. So, basically, over these next, sorry, these next two verses, I'll refer directly, directly to the Savior. If I could speak, that'd be good. <laughs> Anyways, or, but, with righteousness, he shall judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked, and the righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf shall also dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, as a little child shall lead them. So basically here is talking about how, let's talk about the millennium. He shows, some, or Isaiah in several ways, shows that there will be peace during the thousand years when Christ is here on earth after his second coming. So that's what we're currently reading about right now. Let's continue to read on here. It says, And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the second child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the cockthrites' den, and shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be made or shall be full of knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Christ, which shall stand for an ensign of the people, it, or to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall set his people again the second time to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria from the e or f and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath 
and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So, as you, as you all recall from your study of Isaiah so far, and the history of the Holy Land, uh, the twelve tribes split into two nations in bitter dispute over high taxes, etc., after the death of Solomon. Over the years, Ephraim, the ten tribes that were whose nation was in the northern portion of the Holy Land, and Judah, the southern king, or the southern kingdom with Jerusalem and their capital or capital city, became bitter enemies. Therefore, the prophecy that follows is marvelous. It is a prophecy that the day will come when the Jews and the descendants of Ephraim will get along well. We are seeing this today. Oh, excuse me. I woke up a little too early this morning, guys. Anyways, verse 13. The envy of Ephraim also shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not deny, or, well, shall not envy in Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. So, next, Isaiah prophesies about conditions in the Middle East in the last days before the Savior, or before the second coming of the Savior. But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines, or the Philistines towards the west. They shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hand upon uh, Edom and Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, and with his mighty wind he shall shake his hand over the river, and shall smite he or smite it in the seven streams, and make men go over dry shod. Um, and there shall be a highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. Out of chapter 22. In the millennial day, all men will praise the Lord. He will dwell among them. Compare Isaiah 12. So, next it says, that this chapter compares to Isaiah chapter 12 in the Bible. It is a short but beautiful chapter describing how it will be to live on the earth during the millennium. It describes the faithful who survived the destruction at the, de at the second coming of Christ as praising the Lord and rejoicing at the salvation that has come to them. So, yeah, let's just kind of read this. It says, And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Though thou wast angry with my, me, thine anger is turned away, and thou hast comforted to me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in that day shall ye say, Praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, make mention that his name is exalted. 5. Sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, Thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. Okay, so for chapter 23, in chapter 20, the destruction of Assyria was a type of or symbolic of the destruction of the wicked at the second coming we discussed the definition of the of the type in the notes at the beginning of the chapter of chapter 20 which we talked about at the beginning of the stream in this chapter the destruction of babylon is likewise a type of destruction of satan's kingdom that the time of the second or, or at the time of that second coming it will be helpful for you to understand that the ancient city of Babylon was a huge city full of wickedness, about 1,000 miles east of Jerusalem. In fact, Babylon was so big, its walls were 56 miles around it, 335 feet high and 85 feet wide. It was so powerful, or was so big and powerful, that people don't or did not or didn't think it could ever be conquered. Over time, Babylon has come to symbolize the wickedness of the world and Satan's kingdom so big that it seems like it could not possibly be destroyed. Yet you see in this chapter that Isaiah prophesies that Babylon, the actual city, and Satan's kingdom symbolically will indeed be destroyed. So yeah, let's go ahead and read this. Um, okay, so verse one, the burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see. Okay, 
So, verses 2 through 5 next describe how the Lord will gather his righteous forces together to fight against sin and evil. We are watching his righteous people being gathered th or from throughout the world now. And the last days before the second coming of Christ as this gathering Israel takes place. Okay, next, verse 2, it says, Or lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain, exalt the voice unto them, shake the hand, that they may go into the gates of the nobles. Next, Isaiah says in effect that the Savior is leading the gathering of Israel. I have commanded my sanctified ones, I have also called my mighty ones, for mine anger is not upon them that rejoice in my highness. The noise of the multitude in the mountains, like as a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of the nations, from nations gathered together, the Lord of hosts mustereth the hosts of the battle. They come from a far country, please let me scroll, thank you. Uh, they come from far country, from the end of heaven, yea, the Lord, and the weapons of his indignation, to destroy the whole land. How will ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand? It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Also, before that, let's just really quick look at this. Isaiah switches topics from gathering of the righteous to fight together against the wickedness to a strong warning to be wicked, who will soon be facing the consequences for their evil ways. That's just a caption that's supposed to be after verse 5, but I completely missed that one. So let's move on and continue reading. So, 7. Therefore shall all hands be faint, every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them, and they shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the hand desolate, and they shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars and of heaven and the or constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for evil and wicked for their iniquity. I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to be ceased, and I will lay down the haughtiness of the terrible. Again, we see that theme here that has been prophesied, that Christ will put away the prideful. Anyways, moving on. Um, where were we at? 12. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the gold wedge of Ophir. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, in the day of his fierce anger. And it shall be as the chaste roe, and as a sheep that no man taketh up. And they shall every man turn to his own people, and flee every one to into his own land. Everyone that is proud shall be thrust through, yea, and everyone that is joined to the wicked shall fall by the sword. Their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes, their houses shall be spoiled, and their wives ravished. Next, Isaiah gives a, spe or a very specific prophecy regarding how the ancient of Babylon was to be conquered. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them which shall not regard silver and gold, nor shall they delight in it. Their bows or shall also dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. And Babylon, the glory of, or in Babylon, the king of, or, or the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of Chaldee's excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Isaiah prophesied that Babylon would be completely destroyed and never inhabited again, and that is exactly what happened. It remains in ruins even today. The symbolism is clear. Satan's kingdom will be destroyed by the Savior at the time of his second coming, and again after the little season at the end of the millennium, never again to be rebuilt. Okay. So, 20. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, never, or neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. But the wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures, and owls shall dwell there, and satyrs, and satyrs shall dance there. And the wild beasts of the islands shall cry in their desolate houses, and dragons in their pleasant places, their palaces. And her time is near to come, and her day shall not be prolonged, 
for I will destroy her speedily. Yea, for I will be merciful unto my people. Let the wicked shall perish. Okay, so chapter 24. Israel will be gathered and will enjoy millennial rest. Lucifer was cast out of heaven for rebellion. Israel will triumph over Babylon, aka the world. So, yeah, let's continue on with this. So, you will see here that, I, that again, Isaiah is a master teacher. He is an expert at helping us see things because of the words he chooses to use in his writing. He will use very colorful style and imagery as he prophesies concerning the future and downfall of the kingdom of Babylon, then symbolically the downfall of Satan's kingdom, start, starting with verse 4. But first, he assures us that Israel will indeed be gathered in the second days and the last days in preparation for the second coming. And then he assures us, the righteous, that they will enjoy a long-awaited peace during the millennium. Okay. One. For the, or, or verse one. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, and will yet choose Israel, and set them in their own land, and the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob, and they shall take them and bring them forth uh, to their place, yea, far from unto the ends of the earth, and they shall return to their lands of promise, and the house of Israel shall possess them, and the land of the Lord shall be servants and handmaids, and they shall take them captives unto whom they were, cap or they were captives, and they shall rule over their oppressors. Notice that lands in verse 2 above is plural. Among other things, it reminds us that in the last days there are to be several gathering places for Israel. In our day, members are being gathered into stakes of Zion throughout the world. Now Isaiah switches to prophesying about the millennium. And it shall come pass that in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve. Next, Isaiah paints a future scene with words in which he depicts two things, namely the literal fall of Babylon and her wicked king, and also symbolically the future fall of Satan and, er, er, and his wicked kingdom. Such prophecies of Isaiah are known as dual-meaning prophecies. As he sets these things up for his students, Isaiah creates interest and intrigue by telling them that downtrodden Israel will someday come to the point when they will see the king of Babylon as well as Satan himself trimmed down to the size, with no more power to afflict and distress them. Isaiah then creates fascinating imagery to drive home his point that the faithful righteous will eventually triumph over all evil by staying close to God. Verse 4, it says, And it shall come pass that in that day thou shalt take up this proverb against the kingdom of Babylon, and say, How hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased? Verse 5 says, or in verse 5 below, Isaiah confirms that the power of the Lord that will, or that is the power of the Lord that will ultimately break the power of the wicked to afflict the righteous. And it says, The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepters of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger, is persecuted and none hindereth. The whole earth is at rest, and is quiet, and they break forth into singing. The imagery in verse 8 next is that of great or is that of a great big tree being cut down by a lumberjack. The symbolism, as you will see, is that the Lord is cutting down Satan and the and his wicked followers, so they have no more power over the righteous. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and also the cedars of Lebanon sing a, or saying, since thou art laid down, no feller is come against or up against us. Heck, from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth that hath raised up from their thrones, and are all the nations of the nations, or all kings of the nations. It's hard because my eyes will just jump ahead, and then I'm just like, oh wait, I need to, no, read those words. So, the picture that Isaiah paints for us next in verses 10 through 11 is somewhat humorous in a way. It is that the wicked, 
uh, residents of Heck will mock Satan when he is cut down to his size and his kingdom is finally destroyed by the Lord. And that says, All they shall speak and, and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Th thy pomp is brought down to the grave. The noise of thy vowels are not heard. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. Next comes one quote from the most famous quotes from Isaiah regarding Lucifer. It deals with his fall into or from heaven and his rebellious and or rebellion in the premortal life, plus his complete fall and destruction of his evil kingdom after the final battle after the end of the millennium. Okay. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Art thou cut to, down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? Okay, next page. Okay. Next, Isaiah tells us what Lucifer's real thoughts and motives were when he rebelled against God in the premortal war. Then we'll have a long period of time without having captions. So, awesome. Let's do that. So, 13. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like most high, yet thou shalt be brought down to heck, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, and shall consider thee, and shall say, Is the man that made the earth to tremble, did that, or that did shake kingdoms, and he and made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, and opened not the house of his prisoners? Excuse me. 18. All the kings of the nations, yea, all of them, lie in glory, every one of them in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and the remnant of those that are slain thrust through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit as a carcass trodden under feet. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and, thy, and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be re er, renowned. Prepare slaughter for his children, for the iniquities of their fathers, that they do not rise, nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the earth with cities. For I will rise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name and remnant, and the son and the nephew, saith the Lord. One of Isaiah's favorite methods of driving home the point that a kingdom or a wicked kingdom will be destroyed completely is to picture it after the destruction as being desolate and deserted, where only birds and animals live, avoiding humans. We will see this technique in the next verse. It says, I will also make a possession for the bittern and pools of water, and I will sweep it with the besom of destruction, saith the Lord of hosts. Um, Isaiah has finished with Babylon, and he starts a new topic now. Namely, the fate of Assyria, another powerful nation that caused a lot of trouble and pain for the Lord's covenant people. The Lord of hosts, or the Lord of hosts, hath sworn, saying, "Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass; and as I have purposed or proposed, so shall it stand, that I will bring Assyria into my land, or my land, and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off them, and." his burden depart from off their shoulders this is the purpose that is proposed uh, this is the purpose that is proposed upon the whole earth and this is the hand that is stretched out upon all nations for the lord of hosts hath proposed and who shall dissenual and his hand is stretched out and who shall turn it back in the year that king ahaz died was this burden so Isaiah has finished with the Assyrians, now he's talking about Philistines. Again, Isaiah jumps all over the place, that's why I appreciate this book, just helping with that, and as I explained to you guys as well, just because Isaiah can be confusing. And it definitely is. Anyways, let's move on to 29. Rejoice not, whole Palestina, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken, for out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. 
Verse 30 next is Isaiah's prophetic warning that if the Philistines repent and accept the Lord and live his gospel, they can have peace, but if they refuse to, they will be destroyed. And the firstborn of the poor shall feed, and the needy shall lie down in safety, and I will kill the root of thy famine, and he shall slay thy remnant. Howl, O gate, cry, O city, thou whole Pastonia, art dissolved, for there shall come from the north a smoke, and none shall be alone in his appointed times. What shall then answer the messengers of the nations, that the Lord hath founded Zion, and the poor of his people shall trust in it? Now for chapter 25 here, um, let's kind of look at that really quick. So, chapter 25, we are now at, or out of Isaiah, for some time. Chapter 25 says, Nephi glories in plainness, Isaiah's prophecies will be understood in the last days, the Jews will return from Babylon, crucify the Messiah and be scattered and scourged. They will be restored when they believe in the Messiah. He will first come 600 years after Lehi left Jerusalem. The Nephites keep the law of Moses and believe in Christ, who is the Holy One of Israel. So let's read that. Um, okay. Now I, Nephi, do... Uh, let me just really quick read uh, David J. Rodriguez's thing here. He says, One of the great advantages that we enjoy as far as understanding Isaiah is concerned or is concerned is that Nephi explains what we have just read in the previous Isaiah chapters. As of verse 9, he will begin giving specific explanations. In verse 1 through 8, he will explain that his own people had difficulty understanding Isaiah also. This can be, or this can make us feel uh, a little bit better about having difficulty understanding Isaiah's writings for ourselves. So let's just kind of read that. It says, Now I, Nephi, do speak somewhat concerning the words which I have written, which have been spoken by the mouth of Isaiah. For behold, Isaiah spake many things which were hard for many of my people to understand. For they know not concerning the manner of prophesying among the Jews. For I, Nephi, have not taught them many things concerning the manner of the Jews. For their works were works of darkness and their doings were doings of abominations. Wherefore, I write unto my people, unto all those that shall receive hereafter these things which I write, that they may know the judgments of God, that they shall come unto all, or come upon all nations according to the word which he has spoken. Wherefore, hearken all my people, which were of the house of Israel, and give ear unto my words. For because the words of Isaiah are not plain unto you, nevertheless they are plain unto all those that are fulfilled with the spirit of prophecy. But I give unto you prophecy according to the spirit which is in me, wherefore I prophesy according to the plainness which hath been with me from the time that I, can, or I came out of my Jerusalem, or came from Jerusalem with my father. For behold, my soul delighteth in plainness unto my people, that they may learn. As mentioned in verses 1 and 2 above, Nephi's own people have difficulty understanding Isaiah because they have not grown up among the Jews. However, people often ask or whether the Jews themselves understood the words of Isaiah. Next, in verse 5, Nephi answers this question. The answer is yes. Yea, in my soul delighteth in the words of Isaiah, for I came out of Jerus or I came out from Jerusalem, and mine eyes hath beheld the thing of the Jews, and I know that the Jews do understand the things of the prophets, and there is none other people that understand the things which were spoken unto the Jews like unto them, save it be that they were taught after the manner of the things of the Jews. Again, as stated in verse 2 above, Nephi has avoided teaching his people many things about the life of the Jews in Jerusalem um, area because of the wicked lifestyle of that culture. Therefore, his people are a lot like us in that sense that they don't understand the background setting and the symbolism used by Isaiah. In the next verses, Nephi tells us that he will help us by teaching us in plain words what Isaiah was teaching. This gives us a huge advantage in understanding Isaiah over people who only have the Bible. So, yeah. Let's kind of just go through that. Um, yep. Six. 
But behold, I, Nephi, have not taught my children after the manner of the Jews. But behold, I of myself have dwelt at Jerusalem, wherefore I know concerning the regions run about. And I have made mention unto my children concerning the judgments of God, which hath come to pass among the Jews, and to my children according to all that which Isaiah hath spoken. And I do not write them. But to be, or but behold, I proceed with mine own prophecy, according to my plainness, in which I know that no man can err. Nevertheless, I, or in the days that the prophecies of Isaiah shall be fulfilled, men shall know of a surety at the times when they shall come to pass. Wherefore, they are of worth unto the children of men, and he that supposeth that are not unto them will I speak particularly, and confine the words unto mine own people. For I know that they shall be of great worth unto them in the last days. For in that day shall they understand them. Wherefore, their, wherefore their good have I written them. Okay, so let's look at ne or next what Nephi begins his explanation of the Isaiah chapters that he included in his small plates, which we are now reading at this time in the Book of Mormon. He will make Isaiah's writings much clearer for us, starting with verse 9, next, where he explains one major message to us, or of, 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 message of Isaiah to us, and that is, And as one generation hath been destroyed among the Jews because of iniquity, even so have they been destroyed from generation to generation according to their iniquities, and never hath any of them been destroyed save it were foretold them by the prophets of the Lord. Okay, so as you saw in verse 9 above, near the end, we find an important doctrine, namely that the Lord always gives fair warning of the coming of destruction or scattering because of wickedness. This way people have a chance to use their moral agency wisely and are accountable for what happens to them. Nephi gives us an example of this next. 10. Wherefore, it hath been told them concerning the destruction which should come upon them immediately after my father left Jerusalem. Nevertheless, they hardened their hearts, and according to my prophecy, they have been destroyed, save it be those who or which are carried away captive into Babylon. So, next, Isaiah explains that one of Isaiah's most dominant teachings is the gathering of Israel. On a personal note, each of us is invited constantly by the Lord to be gathered to him. So let's just read 11 now. It says, And now this I speak because of the Spirit which is in me, and notwithstanding, they have been carried away, they shall return again, and possess the land of Jerusalem. Wherefore, they shall be restored again to the land of their inheritance. Okay. Next, Nephi explains that Isaiah prophesied that the Son of God would actually come to earth and live among the Jews. So, Let's look at this. 12. Awesome. Let's read 12 and 13. Yeah. But behold, they shall have wars and rumors of wars, and when the day cometh that the only begotten of the Father, yea, even when the Father of and of heaven and of earth shall manifest himself unto them in the flesh, behold, they will reject him because of their iniquities and the hardness of their hearts and their stiff neck or the stiffness of their necks. Behold, they will crucify him, and after he is laid in a sepulchre, or sepulchre for the space of three days, he will rise from the dead with healing in his wings, and all those who shall believe on his name shall be saved in the kingdom of God. Wherefore my soul delighteth to prophesy concerning him, for I have seen this day, and my heart doth magnify his name. Okay. So, the phrase healing in his wings in verse 13 above has, be has beautiful symbolism. Healing is, of course, the Savior's ability and power to heal all of us by the effects of sin, or, or heal all of us of the effects of sin and inadequacies. Wings symbolize the power to be wherever he is needed instantly in order to minister to us. See Dr. Covenant 77 verse 4 for a brief explanation of wings given by the prophet Joseph Smith. Now let's look at uh, verse 14 here. It says, And behold, it shall come to pass, after the Messiah hath risen from the dead, 
and hath manifested himself unto his people, unto as many as will believe on his name, behold, Jerusalem shall be destroyed again. For woe unto them that fight against God and the people of his church. Nephi now te or continues teaching that... Or, or, I'm going to get water really quick. I'm sorry. Next water bottle. Okay, Nephi now continues teaching what Isaiah taught, namely that the Jews would be scattered and badly treated for centuries after they crucified Christ. And then a wonderful thing ha or begins to happen as the Jews begin to believe in Christ and his atonement. A great gathering begins among them. Hmm, interesting, I, that kind of sounds familiar. Verse 15 says, Wherefore the Jews shall be scattered among all nations, yea, and also Babylon shall be destroyed wherefore the Jews shall be dispersed or shall be scattered by other nations and after they have been scattered the Lord God hath scourged them by other nations for the space of many generations yea even down from generation to generation until they shall be persuaded to believe in Christ the Son of God and the atonement which is infinite for all mankind and when that day shall come, that they shall believe in Christ, and worship the Father in his name, with pure hearts and clean hands, and look not forward any more for another Messiah, then at that time the day will come that it must needs be expedient that they shall, or that they should believe these things. So let's just read this next caption. It says, For several verses, Nephi has been speaking very specifically about the Jews. You will begin notice that his prophecy now begins to broaden in the scope to include the gathering of all of Israel in the last days. This is typical of Isaiah and other biblical prophets. They will be talking about one thing, and in the middle of a verse, they will make a transition to another, or a transition to other related topics. So, and the Lord will set his hand again a second time to restore his people from their lost and fallen state, wherefore he will proceed to do a marvelous work and a wonder among the children of men. Wherefore he shall bring forth his words unto them, which words shall judge them at the last day, for they shall be given them for a purpose of convincing them of the true Messiah, who was rejected by them, and unto the convincing of them that they need not look forward any more for a Messiah to come. For there should not any come, save it should be a false Messiah, which should deceive the people. For there is save one Messiah spoken of by the prophets, and that Messiah is he who should be rejected of the Jews. For, according to the words of the prophets, the Messiah cometh in six hundred years from the time that my father left Jerusalem, and according to the words of the prophets, and also the word of the angel of the Lord, or angel of God, his name shall be Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Nephi certainly does teach clearly. He emphasizes the simplic or simplicity of the gospel next by calling to his readers the minds, uh, the brass serpent set up by Moses, so his people who had been bitten by poisonous snakes could be healed if they would simply look at it. But it was too simple for many of them. He reminds us that Isaiah's message is too is beautifully simple: turn to Christ and live. So, verse twenty says. And now, my brethren, I have spoken plainly that ye cannot err. And as the Lord get liveth that brought Israel out, up out of the land of Egypt and gave unto Moses power that he should heal the nations after they have been hit or bitten by the poisonous serpents, if they would cast their eyes unto, or unto the serpent, which he did rise up before them, and also give him power that he should smite the rock and the water should come forth. Yea, behold, I say unto you that as these things are true, and as the Lord liveth, there is none other name given under heaven, save it be this Jesus Christ, of which I have spoken, whereby man can be saved. Wherefore, for this cause hath the Lord promised unto me that these things which I write shall be kept uh, and preserved and handed down unto my seed from generation to generation, that the promise may be fulfilled unto Joseph, that his seed shall or should never perish as long as the earth should stand. 
Wherefore these things shall go from generation to generation, as long as the earth shall stand, and they shall go according to the will of and pleasure of God. And the nations who shall possess them shall be judged of them according to the words which are written. For we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children, and also our brethren, to believe in Christ, stop it, and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all that we can do. So the law of Moses, oh gosh. First of all, the last phrase of verse 23 above is a very important doctrine, our doctrinal statement. Many Christians today are taught that it is by grace that we are saved and that works are not a part of requirements of salvation. They misquote Paul and ignore James completely. Uh, chapter 2, verses 17 through 24. Nephi leaves no doubt as to the need for both faith and works in order to have the grace of Christ save us. Grace, in the simplest terms, means help of Christ. So, yeah, there you have that. And notwithstanding, we believe in Christ. We keep the law of Moses and look forward with steadfastness unto Christ until the law shall be fulfilled. The law of Moses was designed to point people's minds toward Christ and the great sacrifice for their sins, and he would offer through the atonement. 25. For this is, or for this end, was the law given, wherefore the law hath become dead unto us, and we are made alive in Christ because of our faith, yet we keep the law because of the commandments. The next verse is an excellent one to quote to anyone who claims that we do not believe in Christ. 26. And we talk of Christ, we rejoice in Christ, we preach of Christ, we prophesy of Christ, we write according to our prophecies that our children may know to what's worse they may look for remission of their sins. And it's not like our church name is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I wonder what they talk about in the Latter-day Saint Church. Wait, wait a second, let's look at the church name, the Church of Jesus Christ. Wait a second, that's, that's crazy. Anyways, of course I'm speaking sarcastically, but anyways, let's just move on. Verse 27 next is perhaps one of the best verses and simplest summaries anywhere in scripture of the purpose of the law of Moses in relation to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If the time, or if the Jews at the time of Christ had allowed themselves to understand this, what, or which was clearly taught by the Old Testament prophets according to Nephi, they would have been welcomed, or they would have welcomed Jesus. Okay then, let's read. Wherefore we speak concerning the law, that our children may know the deadness of the law, that they, by knowing the deadness of the law, may look forward unto that life which is in Christ, and know for what end the law is given, and after the law is fulfilled in Christ, that they need not harden their hearts against him when the law ought to be done away. Okay. So... It appears that Nephi's people are becoming less committed to God and are more hardened against the spiritual things, and that some apostasy is setting in among them. We conclude this because of what Nephi says next. Um, and now, behold, my people, ye are stiff necked people, wherefore I have spoken plainly unto you that ye cannot misunderstand. The words which I have spoken, shall stand as a testimony against you, for they are sufficient to teach any man the right way. For the right way is to believe in Christ and deny him not, for by denying him ye also deny the prophets and the law. The prophets at the end of verse 28 above are the Old Testament prophets such as Abraham, Enoch, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and so forth. The law consists of the writings of Moses, namely Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Okay, now for verse 29, it says, And now behold, I say unto you that the right way is to believe in Christ and deny him not, and Christ is the Holy One of Israel. Wherefore, ye must bow down before him and worship him with all your might, might, mind, and, or might, mind, and strength, and be your whole soul. And if ye do this, ye shall in no ways be cast out. And inasmuch as it shall be expedient, and or ye must keep the performances and ordinances of God until the law shall be fulfilled which was given unto Moses. Okay. 26 through whatever it is will be, or 26 through 30 will be next week. Make sure you guys tune in then. 
and yeah make sure you so we can't wait for you guys to watch it and we hope you enjoy so yeah without further ado i'll leave you guys to your week good luck everyone and i say these things in the name of jesus christ amen